April 2001. A blood-curdling shriek fills the air of the small market of Alessa, Nigeria. They stole my penis! An out-of-breath man shouts frantically, terror coursing through his veins. Gasping for oxygen, he reaches into his pants to check his manhood. The crowd begins to murmur nervously. Accusations of witchcraft swirl through the air. It's gone! The middle-aged man shouts, My penis is gone! The veins in his forehead are about to pop with anxiety. His very identity is under attack as his genitals seem to retract inside of him, destined to vanish completely. The fear is palpable, and the agitated crowd begins checking their crotches as well. They did it! The paranoid Kendall growls, pointing at the visiting missionaries from the Brothers of the Cross. They want to use it for juju, for witchcraft. They're going to feed my penis to evil spirits. The crowd is now visibly shaken. Whose penis will be next? In an instant act of mob justice, they descend upon the missionaries, throwing tires around their necks, dousing them with gasoline, and then torching the dick burglars and the cars that they came in. When the smoke settles, eight missionaries have been lynched. And the missing penis, on closer examination, was still there. Oops. I really messed up. In actuality, witchcraft wasn't used to abduct the man's penis or put it back. Koro syndrome is actually a culture-bound psychiatric disorder characterized by an overwhelming belief that one's genitals are retracting into your body. It's often accompanied by intense anxiety and fear of impending death. This condition is primarily rooted in cultural beliefs and psychological factors rather than any actual physical changes. The causes of Koro syndrome are multifaceted. Psychological stress, anxiety disorders, and depression can contribute to its development. And additionally, cultural beliefs play a significant role, particularly in East and Southeast Asian cultures where traditional ideas about health, sexuality, and spiritual forces can influence perceptions of bodily changes. Social factors such as economic strain, political tensions, and rapid societal changes may also contribute to the occurrence of Koro, especially in epidemic forms. In some cases, Koro-like symptoms may be secondary to underlying psychiatric conditions such as body dysmorphic disorder or psychosis. The syndrome can be exacerbated by social contagion, where witnessing or discussing similar symptoms with others can lead to a cognitive amplification of body-related beliefs, potentially triggering outbreaks in vulnerable populations. Now, psychotherapy, especially cognitive behavioral therapy, along with anxiety-reducing medication and culturally sensitive education, offer hope to those caught in this terrifying delusion. And while this story isn't specifically about demon possession per se, it does highlight the danger of beliefs in the supernatural and shows how super superstition, and lack of education can have very real life and death consequences. Now we've got several more to cover, but before we get to them, I have to ask, your support on Patreon is what allows me to be able to continue doing this full time, and lately my Patreon has taken a bit of a dip. Would you consider joining with me to spread science and critical thinking by making an ongoing pledge on patreon.com slash holy kool-aid? Every little bit goes a long way. Thank you. Next, we descend into the shadowy depths of a 1700s US mining town. A middle-aged man with tough leather skin and eyes sunken in emerges from the dark, dank tunnels. His body racked with pain. He stumbles into the light, gripping his head. The voices, he mumbles. Why won't they leave me alone? Those nearby murmur a prayer and quicken their paces. The rumors surrounding the demon in the mines have become more frequent. Just last week, another miner claimed he was seeing dark creatures. He began acting erratically, violently even, and attempted to stab his own wife. <laughs> before being subdued by neighbors and locked up in the county jail where he sat clutching his stomach, complaining of severe abdominal pain and constipation, as if a creature, a puppet master, had adopted his body as its physical meat suit. No one in the town seemed to be immune. Given enough time in the mine, even the strongest began feeling fatigue, joint pain, and experiencing mood swings. The fucking voices! Our mystery man yells again before suddenly collapsing to the dirt, convulsing uncontrollably on the ground, foaming at the mouth in an epileptic fit before passing out, falling into a deep, inescapable coma. The community, steeped in religious superstition, turns to the church, which assures them that the miner is indeed under the control of dark forces, demonically possessed by an otherworldly malady. They attempt an exorcism, beating his limp, comatose body in an attempt to drive the demon out. Fearing the evil lurking in the mines, they bring crosses into the depths with them, and church attendance skyrockets. But none of it seems to change their situation, because in reality, the miner's bizarre symptoms, the abdominal pain, irritability, cognitive issues, and even the hallucinations, all of it is actually the result 
of lead poisoning. Chronic exposure to lead, which disrupts enzymes, interferes with calcium metabolism, and damages the nervous system, can produce a host of alarming signs that, before modern science, were often misinterpreted as demonic possession or spiritual attack. Today, treatment focuses on removing the source of the lead exposure, chelation therapy to rid the body of the toxin, and nutritional and behavioral support to restore health. It's 2016, and an 84-year-old African-American woman has just woken up. Performing the same morning routine she's followed a million times over, she reaches for a box of cereal with her right hand and begins to fill the bowl on the counter. Suddenly, before her very eyes, her left hand lurches towards the bowl entirely outside of her control. It snatches the container as if in protest and throws it to the ground, shattering the ceramic bowl into a million shards. Utterly perplexed, she goes to the bedroom to get dressed. But as she reaches for one outfit with her right hand, her left hand again begins to act out, like a child throwing a tantrum. It yanks the outfit out of her right hand, shucks it across the room, and grabs a different dress for her to wear. Terrified, she complies. The rest of the day passes uneventfully, but she remains on edge, suspicious of her mutinying body part. Until that night, as she drifts off to sleep, her hand strikes again, groping her against her will and grabbing her by the throat. Kinky. She fights it off, flips on the light switch, grabs her Bible, and kneels down to pray. The next day, her daughter convinces her to go to the doctor, where she describes her hand as possessed by the devil. But while this sounds like something out of a horror movie, this eerie episode wasn't the result of demon possession or a supernatural curse, but was instead a rare neurological condition called alien hand syndrome. Damage to the frontal lobes often following a stroke or a surgery, or to the corpus callosum which connects the two hemispheres of your brain, can lead to this bizarre disconnect between mind and limb. While there isn't a cure to make this possessed hand obedient again, cognitive behavioral therapy, occupational strategies, and even botulin toxin and injection can help manage the involuntary movements, giving the patient a chance to reclaim control. If you want to learn more about this one, I did an entire video on split brain patients, and it's wild. Like, one guy's left half of his brain used the hand that it controlled to communicate that it was an atheist, while the other half of the person's brain self-identified as a Christian. I'll pen a link to that video in the comments below so that you can check it out after you smash that like and subscribe button and leave a comment letting me know what other conditions you'd like me to cover. Now we turn to ancient Joppa in the southern Levant. The year is 126 BCE. Eli, the local stonemason, has built himself a reputation as the village strongman, until one summer afternoon when he goes to lift a boulder and finds himself lightheaded. His skull aches from the inside with a throbbing pressure, and as his heart rate climbs, his vision suddenly dips to black. The next thing he remembers is waking up in the street, surrounded by concerned onlookers, his hands shaking, and his heart still palpitating. Over the next several months, his condition deteriorates, his appetite soars as if he's eating for two. And yet, in spite of this, his weight drops until he's an emaciated skeleton of his former self. His tolerance to the desert sun vanishes, and he spends his days indoors in a cold, dark hut, or in a cold cave nearby, passing his days alone like an odd hermit. His tremors get worse, he's constantly shaking, and his recently onset anxiety now blooms into full-blown daily paranoia. His family and friends barely recognize him anymore, and they're convinced that he's come under the possession of an evil spirit. They summon the local rabbi for consultation. The demon must be exorcised. But in truth, Eli wasn't possessed, but was instead suffering from hyperthyroidism, a condition where the thyroid gland produces an excess of hormones, leading to a cascade of symptoms such as elevated heart rate, increased appetite, tremors, heat intolerance, anxiety, and unexpected weight loss, which, to those not educated in modern medicine and human anatomy, all together can appear to instead be the chaotic influence of a demon. Today, with treatments like antithyroid medications, radioactive iodine, beta blockers, and sometimes surgery, hyperthyroidism is managed effectively, transforming what was once seen as a curse into a treatable medical condition. Throughout history, belief in demons, spirits, and exorcisms has resulted in countless tragedies, horrific abuses, and violent deaths. And this gut-wrenching reality continues to the present in spite of our ever-increasing medical knowledge. There is no proof whatsoever that demons exist, and every shred of evidence points to natural explanations every 
time. Just because you may not know what might be causing something doesn't mean that the best explanations for your gaps of understanding is something supernatural. Sometimes it's better to turn to people with relevant expertise or to take the time to do a little bit of research. It's amazing how liberating just a little bit of knowledge can be. Now I'm going to continue covering other conditions like these so that you and those you love don't have to live in fear of the unknown. And if you haven't seen my last video covering things mistaken for demons, definitely go check that out. And until next time, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.